Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Keeler, and I'm the Advocacy Manager at Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this parallel session to the UN Commission on the Status of Women, entitled Women and Girls Speak Out, Prioritizing Education in Humanitarian Aid in Afghanistan. Um, and never was a day more important for us all to speak out on this issue than today. It's actually a very sad and difficult day for many of us who are working on this issue. We had approached the date with a, a very cautious optimism that schools would be reopening today, um, as announced by the Taliban, after 186 days of girls over the age of 12 being barred from learning, but instead woke up to actually really heartbreaking footage of them once again being turned away from their school gates in tears as the reopening has been abruptly and really cruelly revoked um, on a moment's notice. A little later, you'll have the opportunity to hear through direct testimonials from young girls, the devastating impact this is having really on an entire generation in Afghanistan. The speed and totality with which Afghan women and girls have seen their rights vanish after two decades of remarkable progress in education and other areas of public life should be a stark warning for all of us. We need to see their cause as our cause and to stand in solidarity with them today of all days. And later on, we'll share some practical um, ideas for how you can do that. To lead us in this conversation today, though, we're so very fortunate to have some trailblazing Afghan women activists, as well as some equally incredible young people from Canada and Afghanistan. Um, this intergenerational dialogue is so needed right now, and we're really honored to be facilitating that. We hope that there will be time for a Q&A at the end of the session, as you may have heard in our very informal chat at the top of the meeting. Uh, so please submit your questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the discussion time. Um, I'd now like to introduce our moderator. Claudia Mitchell is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a distinguished professor in the Faculty of Education at McGill University and an honorary professor in the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. She's the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning journal Girlhood Studies and its related book series, Transnational Girlhoods, and has worked on teacher education, gender, and youth studies in regions including Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and with Indigenous youth in Canada. And her work has won numerous awards. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Claudia over the last few weeks preparing this um, session, and we're um, very lucky to have her. She's a fantastic facilita facilitator for um, conversations like this. So without further ado, um, over to you, Claudia. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for that introduction. And um, yes, it is my great pleasure to moderate this, uh, this panel, Women and Girls Speak Out, Prioritizing Education and Humanitarian Aid in, in Afghanistan. This is indeed a very special panel. Um, featuring as it does strong advocates for girls' education in Afghanistan. The voices of uh, six young women uh, from currently from Canada speaking, speaking and talking about what they're doing in their own situations and schools, and then also bringing in the voices of uh, girls from Afghanistan through their testimonials. Uh, even though they can't be here, their voices will be here. We, as Sarah had said, thought that March 23rd uh, surprisingly was going to be also the first day of girls returning uh, to school, especially in secondary education in Afghanistan and uh, as per the official declarations. And of course, when the session was proposed, we couldn't know that this might have been the day. Um, and now it turns out it's not the day we thought it could be. But I know that when the day was the event was proposed, it was clear that no matter what was happening, this would still land in the middle of very challenging times for the actual implementation of any new policies for girls and schooling in Afghanistan. We know these many months have been so difficult and we know that this could have been the beginning of something new today and now we're not quite sure, but there is no question that the voices that we're going to be hearing today are so clear critical to furthering this. So today in this panel, you are in for a beautiful collection. I love the intergenerational term you used, Sarah. A beautiful collection of activist voices. As the moderator, I will introduce each of our speakers as we proceed over the next hour. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from key actors at the global level. 
and a wonderful intermingling of young activists from uh, Calgary Girls Charter School, uh, young and other young women speaking with their own organization, and who will be reading testimonials from three girls, Marzia, Layla, and Nasia. I will do my best to keep us on track, but I promise that there will be time for questions and answers, and uh, we will take this conversation as far as we can. So welcome to our panel, welcome to you, the audience, and uh, let's, let's start. Uh, I'm going to um, take us right into our very first speaker, uh, Pashtana, who um, has arrived. We're very happy you're here, Pashtana, because you were the first speaker and we were trying to figure out how we we're going to reorganize. So thank you. Uh, Pashtana Durrani is the, uh, an Afghan human rights activist, a community development expert with focus on girls' education. She's the founder of LEARN Afghanistan, a grassroots organization established to safely and securely provide education to girls through a distributed network of tablet computers and an on offline platform. Through LEARN, she has educated 7,000 girls and boys in Kandahar. She's trained more than 80 teachers in digital literacy. Uh, she also focuses on girls' health and has trained 700 girls in menstrual hygiene management. Uh, she's had many awards. Uh, she's an education champion by the Malala Foundation for her outstanding work. She was a global youth representative for Amnesty International, a board member of the steering committee of the Global Environment Facility, an international partnership to address pressing environmental concerns, winner of the 2021 Telberg SNF Eliasson Emerging Leader Prize. Um, she is currently a visiting fellow at Wellesley College Center for Women's Studies, where she's continuing her research to help Afghan women and girls uh, pursue education and support the uh, health of Afghan women and babies. So, Welcome, Pashtana. Um, I have a question for you, uh, which is really to, to start start the start the ball rolling in terms of uh, where we are on our. Um, where are we? Here we are. Um, I have seventeen pieces of paper in front of me. So the first question. I apologize. The first this first question for you, and we would love to hear what you have to say for the next five or six minutes. Beyond the school ban enacted by the Taliban last September, and still there, can you tell us what barriers girls in Afghanistan face in accessing education, and what LEARN is doing to embed education in its humanitarian response? So it's kind of a two-part question. So over to you, Pashtan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. I just felt so important as you were doing my introduction. I was like, oh my god, is that even me? <laughs> for a minute, I just felt very important. <laughs> but thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I'm so happy to be here and for a lot of people to be here. Um, it's definitely a critical uh, day for all the Afghan women, Afghan girls, and everyone on this panel, especially, who has been um, greatly involved in Afghanistan for several uh, years and decades now. Um, for me, I, I think I would rather focus on uh, what we have done in the past six to seven months rather than um, the, because the barriers have always been there, right? Uh, we cannot deny that, yes, there is always some level of barrier when it comes to girls' education, especially in Afghanistan. Um, the barriers have now, uh, like, you know, hit a limit when it, where it has become severe. Um, back in the day, the, the reason LEARN was started was the fact that there was no access to education in the rural areas like Spinbolda or Marov, where there are girls uh, available to get educated, but they cannot access schooling because the government was too corrupt to even build a school in the first place, or there was war. So Marov being a district where there has always been war, it was under the Taliban control, there was no schooling available from the first time. But then at the same time, the government was paid for, for 43 schools uh, for Marov and 130 teachers who got their salaries, but there were no running schools. So a, a district under war where the Taliban have held it hostage. But then at the same time, um, the government paying salaries to ghost schools and ghost teachers. That's the first way that um, you need to understand that women of Afghanistan and girls of Afghanistan were robbed from the right of education by both parties. 
Now, when you come to the practicalities of it or the technicalities of it, when it comes to girls' education, the first thing is having a structure, a safe space to access education. Now, the 70% of the country, which is ruler country, um, uh, starting from Zobel, where uh, Muska originally originates from, and I love her and I love her sisters <laughs> because they were my roommates, just so you guys know. <laughs> um, uh, from Zabul up until Kandar or any other province that you pick in Afghanistan, apart from Kabul, um, there are no schooling structures available that can fully facilitate girls' education. From By that, uh, what I actually mean is the fact that, yeah, there might be a school structure available, but there might not be a, a running water. If there is running water, there is no toilet. If there are toilets, there are no teachers available. If there are teachers, there are no school resources available. So all those things, but that was before August 15. Today, you are looking at a different Afghanistan. Today, even if there are schools available, even if there is no running water in school, even if there are no washrooms in school, even if there are no teachers in school, even if there is one teacher or, and very limited resources, today, the girl cannot even access that space. Today, the girl cannot even learn in that space. Um, I remember my father, he used to, uh, like, you know, when my sister or I used to come up with excuses like, oh, I don't know how to understand this problem in math or something like that. And my mom and my father used to, be like, used to be like, oh, if you want to learn, you can learn anywhere. Today, that's the sort of thing that we need to understand that there is nowhere for girls to learn. There is no place for girls to actually access to learn. So in this situation, the first thing that you can see the pattern in the past, past seven months is the fact that um, schools did up, open up in the northern areas um, because those uh, they they had this break and then they just started with the pattern. But in Kandar, where the school was supposed to be opening uh, in September, it never actually opened. And when it opened from grade one to grade six, it opened in a sense where it was very limited. The uh, policies were very discouraged. The teachers were harassed and nobody even dared sending their uh, daughters to school post that even under the grade six. So you need to understand the barrier right now is not just a normal barrier like it is in other countries that are developing like lack of resources, lack of teachers. There is a discouraging policy for girls put in place that if you are from grade one to grade six, your teachers will be harassed. If you're from grade seven to grade 12, you're not allowed to come to the school. And post that if you want to go for higher education to any other country, you need to take a mahram. Now and with mahram, it's just at the same time, it's for me, it's frankly funny, but at the same time, so absurd because it's not practical. Your father could be 57 year old, he doesn't want to study BSc in mathematical engineering with you. Maybe he's not even interested in that. Uh, your brother could be two years old because Afghans love procreating and we could have baby brothers and we might not even have a bigger brother, older brother to go with me. And he might not even be interested in going with me to another country to study the same subject that I want. Last but not the least, girl from age uh, 13 to 25 who wants to go for higher education has to have a mahram. That leaves one option, which is husband, right? So you need to be married to in order to continue with your higher education. These are all sorts of practicalities that we sort of miss in, in the whole midst of it. But last, which one point which nobody wants to talk about is the technicality of one whole year being missed. The academic year is nine uh, months. And in those nine months, the girls are supposed to be educated, promoted to the next class, their exams and everything needs to be taken. Right now, girls seven months have already been wasted. And what I am hearing from the South is that they are told not to come for this year. They will be promoted, but nobody can trust the Taliban anymore because they also said that the schools will open on the 23rd of March. So how do you trust them? So those, these are the sort of layers that we need to see that it could be lack of resources, but at the same time, it's subtle discouraging policies that stops girls from even dreaming about a better future through education. When we were kids, I remember we were told that education your, is your way to freedom, especially in Afghanistan or the communities we grew up in. Um, and by freedom, I don't mean that you just go on and become a rebel or something like that. By freedom, I meant rebuilding our country, stabilizing our country, paying tax, uh, tax money, uh, making sure that we become active part and responsible citizens of Afghanistan. Right now, that is not happening. Afghanistan is failing economically because 35% of workforce is at home. They're not teaching, they're not working. So right now, it's uh, the daughters of Afghanistan are treated as if they are not from Afghanistan. And I will stop here. I don't want to take a lot of your time, yeah. 
Thank you, Pashtana. You, yeah, you just you raised so so many points, and uh, I'm I'm glad you just seized on on where where you think this need what what it is and where this needs to go. Um, thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to move on to our next uh, piece in the program, which is to hear from. Um, from two groups of young women, girls and young women. Uh, we're going to meet um, five, we're going to be, meet the first couple of girls from the Calgary Girls Charter School. Uh, and they're going to be reading, they're going to be talking and they're also going to be reading from uh, one of the testimonials from, um, from uh, Afghanistan. So I just want to say a little bit of a shout out to this school. I, I, I teach teachers, I'm in a faculty of education and I cannot think of anything more amazing to think about a school that has taken on the issues around um, uh, social change and how this is part of the curriculum. So the school this year in, in the Calgary uh, Charter Girls School, uh, Girls Charter School, uh, there a, was a class called Social Impact, which focused on advocacy and activism on the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. And the five uh, girls you're going to meet today, the first two will be Taylor Merritt and uh, Fatima Armin, um, are two of the girls in that class. And they're going to tell you a little bit about how they've been thinking about advocacy and where this is, fits into their school. And then we're going to hear from um, uh, Renad uh, Hussein, who's going to read one of the testimonials uh, from Marzia. So, Taylor and Fatima are going to talk first, and then we're going to seamlessly move over to uh, Rana reading. And um, I'm just so excited to hear you. So over, over, over to you, Taylor and Fatima. Thank you. Maybe we can go to the next person until she is talking. Uh, Taylor, I hope you'll be able to hear us. Um, you're breaking up a great deal. We can't really hear you. I'm wondering, Fatima, if you have um, the same presentation, do you want to take over from Taylor? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Okay. Good morning. My name is Taylor, and it is share with you who we are and what ha we have accomplished. I am one of 14 grade seven students from Calgary Girls Charter School who work together in social impact class. This experience has given us a better understanding of how we can affect great change through small acts. Our work gave us a sense of global interconnectedness and an opportunity of advocates and leaders in our school our local community, as well as across the globe. The primary goal of this class was to improve our understanding of what it means to be an ally, what it means to do, to what it means to do, become active members of society and how to speak out meaning in meaningful ways. Hello, my name is Fatima. We started by studying current events and learning about the inequities that are happening in our world today. We focused on the crisis that girls and young women are facing in Afghanistan and organized multiple events to show our support for the Afghan refugees who began arriving in our, in our city. Working with the organization Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan has been mutually impactful. Today, we will be speaking on behalf of the girls with whom we are connected through the work of Women for Women. We have left the translations as pure as they were originally written in order to honor the voices and words of the girls who wrote them. Thank you so much, Fatima. And speaking 
for Taylor as well. We really appreciated that. Um, over to you, Renad, to, uh, this is Renad uh, saying to read um, this Marzia's story. Yeah, okay. okay. As you probably mm -hmm. know, Afghanistan always had economic and security challenges and life was not easy, but we are happy anyway. We went to school with so much hope and I plan to graduate from school. I learned so many things in school, including science, poetry, and literature, which was my favorite subject. We enjoyed going shopping for outings to parks, to parties with friends and family. Before, we could hear music everywhere in the streets and homes. When Taliban came to Afghanistan, all of our lives changed. These days, we, had, we have no opportunity to go to our universities or to schools. And learning is not like before especially for the English language and literature field. They make so many rules for girls that we have become hopeless and depressed. No, we can't do anything we want. We can't wear our clothes as we want to wear. They make a rule to wear hijab and even if they do allow girls, they separate girls and boys classes and times. Girls don't have any time in school. Taliban do not allow us anything because they do not like women and girls to go outside and also do not allow us to become educated as an Afghan educated. As an Afghan girl, I want to finish my school and graduate from university. I want to continue my education and I want to spend my life with things that I love doing and that I am free to choose. I want to use my skills. I want the world, the world leaders to know that in Afghanistan, all people and especially girls like me are in danger. Every day, we don't know that Taliban will do with our lives. Afghan people's hopes, future, our education, all of our wishes have been destroyed. Our bodies are alive, but without hope or opportunity to grow, our souls are gone. I think that all of us died on August 15th, 2021. If you came to Afghanistan now and saw the people's lives here, you will see and feel our deep um, disappointment because there is no life here. Our life has ended but we want to hope and learn. Please help us girls to feel hope again, fight along with us and become educated and to make a life of, for ourselves and our families. Mm. It was beautiful, this heartfelt heart. That's, you, you, you read those words, Renat, so beautifully and the, the voice of, uh, Marzia came through so beautifully as well. So thank, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. Um, so we're, we are going to uh, move to um, next little segment of the program, which uh, will introduce us to Muska uh, Isan, um, who is a, a 17 year old activist from, uh, originally from Afghanistan. Uh, and she's going to tell us about the organization she founded. Um, Muska, uh, after the, so Muska, after the fall of the Afghan government, she and her family migrated to Canada. But at the age of 12, she was working at a kid's TV show called, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Baglaram Bag Shalaram. Um, after, and after two years of experience, she moved to Kabul city for her education. In the meantime, she's participated in multiple online programs such as Global Youth Development, Pax Populi, um, cultural exchanges, um, and she's always worked for and to be a positive change in the Afghan community, taking, taking workshops, involving and in, participating in workshops. But a remarkable piece about um, Mosca is that in addition to all of that, um, she has started a program under the name of YFYC. Youth for Youth Community. And as she notes in what she wrote about this, unfortunately, most Afghan girls cannot continue their education due, due to restriction, restrictions. Accordingly, the YFYC team's goal is to support an online platform for youth around the world to connect and help Afghan girls through volunteering to tutor, uh, providing academic services. She believes that as global citizens, it is our responsibility to be there for each other. We are all in this together, she writes. Over to you, Muska. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Claudia. That was such a sweet introduction. Well, at first, I would like to thank you so much for inviting me. It feels amazing to share my thoughts with all of these such amazing group of women. Uh, before I talk about Afghan girls' education, I want to say that education is a human right, which cannot be limited by gender. For every individual citizen of the earth, it's important to get education because, of course, it gives you power, confidence, a voice which you come to know about your rights and your ability. Now, here's the most amazing part about educating a young woman because these young um, educated girls will someday become educated women which will lead to a positive and successful society in our culture we have an old saying um, if you educate a woman you educate a generation so that's the idea that we go on with and after the past government of Taliban back in 2001, it was a dark period until Afghanistan came back on its feet. Back in the days, women themselves were against education because that was what the society had taught them. They were brainwashed. They were unaware of their rights. They believed that women do what men tell them to do. I'm afraid we might go back to the dark pages if we do not provide educational facilities to Afghan girl. Having the identity of, a, of an Afghan girl makes you a fighter, a resilient fighter, a survivor, thirsty for education. We've just had enough. Nobody can fool us anymore. We've had enough of the darkness. If you're stopping me from getting education, it means you're scared of me. You're scared of my power. You're scared of an educated woman. And it breaks my heart when I look back at my country's history. It upsets me how much struggles Afghan women went through. The, the things they fought for just to get here to educate themselves for future generations. Unfortunately, with the current situation it feels like our hard work is being faded which is unacceptable indigestible and inexcusable though we fight to get what is our right but we will not be able to do this without the world's support afghan girls should get education because that is their right and that's their religious duty we do not deserve this war and we do not deserve this unfairness Behind the uh, Youth for Youth community, there's actually a really sad story. Uh, well, my friend called me at 3 a.m. and she was crying and crying. I was like, hey, what's up? What's the matter? What's wrong? And she kept crying and crying. And then uh, with a very low voice, she said that, Muska, everything is finished. Why is the world quiet? Who am I without my future? Who am I without education? And those words, they just broke my heart. And it just kept me thinking because those words were bothering me. They were teasing me and I couldn't forget those words. And that's how I got the, uh, I, that's how the Youth for Youth community idea struck my mind. That now it is difficult for girls to go to school. It is better for them to build connections with the youth outside Afghanistan, because that's how you spread awareness. We are all, as I'm always saying this, that we are all in this together. We have to care about each other from, from all corners of the world that's how we empower and support each other so we created this youth for youth community platform and i cannot i cannot i cannot thank canadian women for women afghanistan enough for funding youth for youth community now around 25 girls in afghanistan can study with us without any internet issues thank you so much Thank you so much, Mosca. I know uh, the, the chat the chat is filling up with questions, and people will, uh, will want, as as with everyone we've heard from, will want to know more. But this is really really inspiring to hear your words. So and and hear about this organization. Um, we're going to uh, uh, move to um, 
hearing more of the testimonials uh, from the girls from Afghanistan and return to the Calgary Girls Charter School. Uh, this time we're going to hear from um, Emily uh, Gilling and um, Nimrit um, Sangara, who are, going to, who are going to read two of the testimonials. So Emily is going to read Layla's story and Nimrit is going to read Neja's story. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Emily. Thank you. As a young girl, I had a simple life in a village, but I had hopes that one day everything will be well because there were chances to get educated and become a successful woman. Even though I came from a village where women are nothing, I started my school at sixth grade, but with support from an NGO, I graduated from one of the best schools in Afghanistan. After school, it was my goal to get admission to American University of Afghanistan. Even though I was from one of the most remote villages in Afghanistan, I had worked hard and with support succeeded to achieve my biggest goals in life. On August 15th, I was in my first week in university when the situation became suddenly worse and I didn't know what I could do. It was impossible to turn back to my home without, without any male escort because all provinces had become taken over by Taliban. They, they had ordered that women and girls were not allowed to go on the streets without a male relative. Even if I had a chance to get back, I would never again be able to continue my education. Taliban does not believe girls should have the right to learn or to be free. Before August 15th, I had been living in a student dorm, but they were all starting to close and I had just one chance to save my life and dreams. And it was running to Pakistan along with some of my friends. I came without any plan. And unfortunately, I lost all of the things that I worked so hard to build. Now I live in Pakistan alone without my family. I don't even know how my mom is. I am not able to talk to her virtually because my mom does not have a phone or internet connection. And this situation being so far from my mom really hurts me. I don't even know how she is. I'm worried about her safety. The corn situation in Afghanistan completely changed my life. I lost my hopes of university, my family, my country, friends, wishes, and goals. I lost the scholarship to continue my education, which has been my only hope because I come from a very, very poor family with only my mother to support us. Now I live in Pakistan, but my thoughts are always in Afghanistan. Thinking what will happen for girls in our country, especially their education. I wonder about myself and my future. I'm not sure how long I can continue with this situation. I am a girl who just graduated from school and I was starting a new life. Now, instead of focusing on my lessons, I worry every day what will happen to me tomorrow. My biggest wish is to get educated and become an independent woman. It is my human right. And actually every girl in Afghanistan wishes, wishes so. But unfortunately, we lo lose our way and our rights in the darkness which the Taliban has brought to the lives of girls and women. Now I live without any support or fall for my family. And my biggest hope is to get the scholarship to continue my education. My hopes are for other countries to provide Afghan girls with more scholarships and to take our hands to come up through the darkness. We can only do this with basic rights and education. Please do not forget us. Please tell the world about our darkness and our hopes for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We're going to um, move to um, Nimret reading Neja's um, testimonial as well. But these, these are these pieces are just so beautiful, and they just uh, the they bring so much to how the, 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 the concrete and, and the dreams. So 
Nimra, over to you. Before August, we had many things to occupy our time. I used to spend time on my studies. At school, everything was great. With our teachers and friends, we went on big picnics together, hung out in break times, and could go outside onto the streets and shops without any problems. I am preparing to take the university entrance exams. I better say I was, because now I'm far from the school and have little hope. Many things changed after the Taliban came. The schools and universities closed and girls were not allowed to go anywhere without a mask. We suddenly were afraid of going outside onto the streets or anywhere because the situation is not fine. It is not like it was before. Since this war started, we spend our time in the house doing chores. I don't see friends or classmates and I don't know what happened to any of them, if they are okay. I still remember the face of my mother and the shouts of my younger brother when there were gunshots in the city. I remember how everyone was scared and depressed by the situation. Now I can't dream of anything. I lost my dreams. Those days of hope have ended. I am a lost person in an unfamiliar country. Even if schools do reopen, I can't continue my studies because security isn't good. It's not safe for us girls to go outside. We have no access to knowledge. Also, my family's economic situation isn't good, and they don't have money to pay, pay so I can continue my education. If I had the opportunity to speak out to world leaders, I would say, do not leave us alone. At the moment, we do not have access to even our most basic right to education and employment. We breathe, but we do not live until our schools and universities are opened, and we are free to go again without fear and going hungry. We want peace in our streets. I do not want to stay at home and not work or study. Both women and men should have the same rights to develop their country. They have the same rights to study and work for the improvement of their country and have a good peaceful and have a good peaceful life. Every girl needs a chance to grow. Please do not leave us alone. If you forget us today, our next generations will remain in the dark. I think now only your advocacy can affect the Taliban's rule over women. From inside of Afghanistan, we can't do anything because no humanitarian rules and regulations are observed by the Taliban. Please hear our voices. We need solidarity from all the people of the world. Don't forget Afghan girls. Please raise our voices over every corner of the world. We want your help so we can have a war free and peaceful Afghanistan. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my situation. Thank you, Nimrit. And you, you, you did exactly what Nija asks for, raising, raising the voices. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, move to uh, hear from uh, uh, Rahela Siddiqui, uh, who is uh, no stranger to this work. She has been passionately working as a community development expert with Oxfam, with UNHCR. Uh, she completed a, a master's degree at Reading in rural development. In 2015, she created a charity called the Rahela Trust for Afghan Women's Education, which provides higher education scholarships and mentorship to talented and disadvantaged Afghan girls and women. Um, as of today, the organization has provided scholarships and mentorships to 36 scholars at different universities. 20 of the scholars are now at university and six have graduated and many of them have very good jobs. Um, in 2019, uh, Rahela founded uh, got what's called Governance and Reform Advisory, GRA, with the aim to enhance performance in public and private sectors and to ensure good governance, accountability, transparency and trust, which leads to improvements in living standards. Um, GRA until August 2021 was a group working so closely with the Afghan ministries of women's affairs and foreign affairs to advise, to provide capacity programs. And of course, as Rakela noted in her comments, all of this stopped with the Taliban takeover of the capital of, on the 15th of, of August. So Rahela, welcome. Uh, we have a question for you, which is to, um, Talk about how can mentoring, which is very close to your heart, I know, how can mentoring young women and investing in their education help Afghanistan to overcome its current humanitarian crisis? Over to you and welcome for being here. 
Thank you, dear uh, Claudio. And it's a privilege to be among all of these uh, beautiful young generation with their inspiring work. Um, what I would uh, like to uh, say is uh, actually uh, what kind of solutions we can provide to the situation in a, in a long term, in a sustainable uh, way for sustainable development. It's actually, uh, as you said, our work, uh, what I believe is not only education, but also coaching and mentoring, that people, women and the young generation in the turn contribute back to their communities. And uh, when we are talking about uh, how this contribute to the future of Afghanistan sustainable in, in a sustainable way, it's actually, increasing the number of the women in education, but we know the sad stories of today, but we should, we should not stop. What we did by Omid International, when this crisis comes, uh, happened in, on 15th August, I was really shocked and I thought, okay, is that the, the education that I'm providing for girls in Kandahar, in Helmand, in Jimutiri of Afghanistan, including coaching and mentoring that so excitedly they were trying to contribute back to the community, which we were providing uh, coaching and mentoring beside education to them. They were providing uh, like peer uh, support to their classmates and also to their community. Uh, so is that enough? No, I thought, no, this is not enough. So what is so very important to see that this crowd of refugees around the countries and neighboring countries, that they need a skill building, they need job. What can we do to, to manage those crises? But in a, with, with the sustainable path, uh, pathways, through education, through provision of a scholarship, uh, like several uh, of our uh, speakers, uh, young speakers sp uh, speak about it. This scholarship is very critical for this young generation in neighboring country, in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Turkey. Uh, I, I just came from Istanbul and uh, with the very little fund from GRA, I tried to, through uh, Omid International, I tried to build the capacity of like 11 uh, girls uh, and, and youth, young women and youth to uh, be recruited and to restore their dignities and to see that, okay, how they see that themselves uh, uh, to see their hope. And uh, it's like, uh, sorry, I just my note. Um, so uh, this is one of the, one, one of the example and that needs to be, to be increased uh, because th it gives them to restore their dignity. It uh, helped them to be self-sufficient, self-reliance, self, uh, re be on their own feet and to be out of the poverty. So wherever we talk about whatever way to sustainable development, education is the key as everybody was highlighting. Uh, and and, and to, uh, to, to contribute to the country economy. These are, I wouldn't say 35%, no, Women are 50 percent of over 50 percent of the populations. How come a country can be sustained in terms of development if the women are not contributing? Uh, I don't think this, the Taliban, with their cruel uh, uh, systems, they will last uh, if the international community really be very hard with them. So that is one of the one of the way that international community also take uh, a harder steps and be more responsible to stop them. Uh, and and, and at, again, education at this time, actually it was through my uh, moral building and, and, and supporting them. You could see that they are uh, like the trauma of yesterday can slowly uh, help them. It, it, it's a process of healing because it's time to speak with them. It's time that not, not only education, but true education also to understand what are their so multiple worries of these women, so how those can be released. Uh, and, um, and also in terms of uh, mobilizations of these uh, young generation through different, uh, uh, from, from different countries to connect them, to classify uh, actually that 
how many people are in education, in, in the economic sector or in business administration, what they lost. Were they in second year of the university? Were they in uh, 12 years of uh, education? So at least what I'm trying to say here, at least we are um, restoring the, those who get out of the countries and with the crowd of uh, refugees in neighboring countries, what we will do actually, and the international community contribute and invest on these human capital, they will be definitely contributing back to Afghanistan development process with large and massive numbers. How many populations uh, of refugees are in Turkey? 850,000 refugees are in, just in, 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 in Turkey. How many are in Pakistan and Iran and in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan? We have to come to the realities of expanding this process of scholarship. What I would really recommend that we have to really see critically the right to education for women. And we have to see multiple ways of contributing and investing on women education, not only education. Again, I would emphasize on mentoring and coaching parallel to having the subject, the, the specific subject of education. So comprehensive approach and holistic approach to invest on education when we design the education. The skill building, definitely my recommendation is to those who are educated, who have a degree, who may have some English language, who may have some skills of computer, how to, be, how to build on that. And I would also suggest that Say in 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 Bonn in in Bonn conference in in a 10, 20 years back, that the four key uh, suggestion was to invest on education. In today's program of peace negotiation, this has to be more harder. This has to be the key and the top agenda of the world and the community and the people, and our advocacy needs to be continuously uh, by with the evidences. Uh, to, to the international community with the provision of uh, evidences. Monitoring, another recommendation that this monitoring of the, uh, the, 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 these uh, um, the educations uh, that, this, that the girls are stopped and the people are stopped from education, this needs to be really monitored and stopped Taliban from these very cruel actions. Um, and uh, I would definitely go for uh, investment of uh, fund inside Afghanistan, also for, for girls um, in, in, in different ways, education. Like we provided 200 of women and youth through Omid International skill building, and then recruit them back to, to have a, a, to use their, their, their degree, to have their education, to have, sorry, to have their uh, uh, income. So, Without this, I would definitely say that there will be no, there will be waste of the resources, unfortunately, waste of human resources in Afghanistan, waste of this massive young generation resources. If there is no investment on education and the key to development process, I would repeatedly say is education and the world should not forget Afghanistan and should not forget that the sustainability, sustainable development of Afghanistan needs to contribute on education. Thank you. Uh, education, education, education. Prior, prior, prior to prioritizing education in this time is the theme of the panel and definitely the theme coming through every single speaker and uh, seeing, seeing uh, girls in the middle of their education, seeing, hearing from girls who've been denied their education and thinking of uh, schools and organizations around the world that can, can help to do this. And uh, where there's so many comments in the, in the chat, I can see going by around rights and freedom and solidarity. These are all such important pieces that you've brought to this. Um, we're going to open this up to a um, lot of questions from, uh, from, uh, from the audience. But, uh, before I turn it back over to Sarah, I just really want to say thank you. 
thank you to all of you who have made this time to to prepare and to come to this uh, to Taylor, Fatima, Renee, Renaud, Renaud, Amelie, and Nimrat, and your teachers who were and your school behind you. So just amazing presentations and uh, the work that you're doing um, is just so important. And I think, oh, you're in the seventh grade. <laughs> you, well, you're already doing so much. Um, and of course, on, on behalf of the beautiful stories that you read from Marzia, Leila, and Neja, uh, who are so present here today through you and through your, your words. So that is so, so important. Um, and of course, to thank Pashtana and Luska and Rahela, your words were so um, stirring. You're doing, you've been doing this work uh, for, well, a long time or a short time, but in a very passionate time. Uh, and we thank you for making the time to come here today. Um, and of course, to Sarah and the Canadian Women for Women uh, in Afghanistan, the organizers of this event, I, I just want to thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, we know that there's an awful lot to do and that it's going to take the vigilance of all of us uh, to see what these next next steps might be. We are and and trying to second guess what will happen next in the in the in the bigger picture. Um, I, I know there are lots of people listening from all over and I'd like to do a little acknowledgement. I think some of my students from McGill are here today. I want to mention this in particular because um, there's a very close relationship for me to um, the, the struggle around girls' education in Afghanistan, going back to um, a former doctoral student of mine, Dr. Jackie Kirk, um, who was killed in Afghanistan in 2008 uh, with other people working with the International Rescue Committee. Uh, they were shot by the Taliban and uh, this brought such, um, such grief to our our, our university and around the world. And, but it also brought a great deal of attention uh, to thinking about what kinds of programs we should be supporting in post-secondary institutions and research. So although that work eventually did lead to some change, um, as we're all hearing from today, um, we need way more of the whole world uh, speaking out and especially women and girls speaking out. Um, we, have, we have new unity. Uh, we have new solidarity, but we need even more. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah and uh, just uh, join in on the, on the discussions and uh, questions and answers as we hear them. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Claudia, for, um, yeah, that, that powerful summation. Um, so we have, I think time for a few questions and they have been coming in. The chat is very active. We see lots of actual um, additional kind of testimonials and accounts from some of the young women joining us from Afghanistan or who have been recently displaced. So thank you also for sharing those perspectives. Um, actually, Muska, for you, um, we have a couple of inquiries about actually interest in, in your, your project, your program, Youth for Youth, and how people can get involved. But just before turning over to you, um, I would like to say that, you know, for everyone who's registered for this session today, we will be um, sending out a follow-up email, and we're going to invite all of our panelists to share resources um, and information, further information about the work that they're doing. So you will also have the opportunity to um, learn further in that follow-up email. Um, but... Um, Muska, maybe you would like to um, to speak a little bit to how people can get involved with your amazing initiative. Yeah, sure. Uh, the um, we are very active on an, our Instagram uh, page, which is YFYC official. You can get the information from there. Uh, until now, we have only released. Um, teacher or teacher's application and very soon we will be releasing um, students application but for now it's only for mentors we're going through the process so um, the links and everything is on our instagram page thank you so much Muska. so we'll be sure to share um, links like that when we um, are back in touch with people in follow-up to this um, i have a question here, I guess about the, the broader situation as it continues to be in Afghanistan, um, Pashtana and maybe Rahela, um, you would like to address the question from Hedy. Um, can girls study at home? Is there the possibility for them to continue their learning at home? Do they have access to books? Do they have access to each other? What resources are girls using right now 
um, to find ways to, to educate themselves in the um, deplorable absence of a proper education system. Uh, sh should I go first? Because I see myself pinned. <laughs> okay, um, I, I think um, starting with the fact that we right now have around 700 girls over the seven provinces that we work with. It's Kandar, Helmand, um, uh, Faryab, um, Mazar, uh, Bamiyan, and Kabul. And uh, all of them have re uh, been accessing our online, sorry, there's a lot of knock um they have been accessing a lot of online resources through our website which is www.learnafghan.org where if you go you will find an online school which is in pashto and dari and hopefully in uzbeki someday um where you can find all the learning resources from grade one till grade 12 and that's something for free you just need to register and you'll access it apart from that as rahila said we also have our courses which actually helps you get um jobs for freelancing so we have graphics designing, we have website development, we have designing courses, we have more of the stuff that actually helps you support your family in this course of time and in this poverty level that we have right now in Afghanistan. So if you enroll in those courses, we'll be actually mentoring you to get uh, uh, more jobs in through LinkedIn or through Fiverr. So those resources are available on the website of Learn and I'll be sending it to you so you can send it to everyone. And I think that's it for me right now yeah Rahela would you like to add anything yes yes I I think online is uh, the best way if we provide them resources um, uh, now for example the the way that we are trying to see uh, uh, to cooperate with one of the universities uh, for the refugees and also inside of Afghanistan to provide um, if any, we find any scholarship for those who cannot access education, higher education, I would call, because my, my area is uh, undergraduate and also uh, master's and PhD, we are trying to see uh, for the refugees. out. So uh, I would advise uh, online education and also uh, to try and see that if you could provide to those who are educated and have get some skills to find job for them, even at the EU market, Canada market, US market through online so that they haven't come. That would be my strong suggestions to the international community. Thank you both for that. And I would just add that um, from our side, Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan, um, one of our major program areas um, operating in Afghanistan and now increasingly for the large displaced population of Afghans in in the region and internationally really is technology for education. Um, and it's an area where we're rapidly expanding to meet the growing needs um, of girls and women who can no longer access the formal education that they were able to prior to August last year. Um, so you'll see that there are a number of initiatives. We're also seeing people share in the chat um, initiatives that are very youth led. Um, again, we will compile all these resources and share them with people in a follow up, but it's also very heartening to see this kind of very, um, you know, people are rolling up their sleeves um, and, and getting the work done and making sure that um, one way or another, girls and women do have access to education. Um, and I think it's also, you know, a, a powerful form of solidarity um, that allows them to know that they're not, they're not standing alone in this, um, in these dark moments. And if I may, um, start out, sorry, I have to jump on this one. Um, for those who cannot access uh, learning through internet, of course, we do understand that there is limited internet. The 700 girls that we have right now are actually in a public uh, community areas that were provided by all these communities from Tahar till Faryab, and all of them have internet. So if you are in one of those areas, definitely contact us so we can give you the address to access those digital labs. That's the first thing. We're working with Starlink to get the satellites up and running so probably by the end of this year we'll have internet uh, through in the in those schools and it will be free and fast so you can definitely access those stuff and apart from that yes they have computer and yes we have it in Bamiyan too um Apart from that, we also have it online learning and most importantly, we have through radio. We are about to launch our schooling in radio, so you can most definitely check out that. And most importantly, you can access learning through Facebook. So 
of course, learning is important, but also learning that supports your career, that supports your learning in a way that gives uh, generates money. So our main focus is educate girls in the first year to generate a good income through graphics designing, website development, and everything. And post that, we focus on giving them general curriculum or using it in parallel exercises. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Pashtana. And yeah, really important to think about. And I think, you know, um, both Rahela and Pashtana have done a wonderful job of kind of um, connecting those dots in, in looking at how, you know, why education really does matter now in responding to, to this humanitarian crisis. We need to equip Afghans with skills that will be usable for them in the job market and that will also equip them to, um, to be a part, to take the lead actually in the, the recovery from, um, you know, the, the current um, governance and healthcare um, and economic crisis that the country is facing. So. Um, thank you for kind of um, highlighting that for us so nicely. I have um, a question actually that I think would go to, well, to Muska, but also to any of the girls from the Calgary Girls School who would perhaps like to answer. Um, what advice do you have as young people yourselves for other young people who want to stand up for their beliefs and champion girls' rights? Does anyone want to take that? Yeah. So I would like to tell them that trust your guts and believe in yourself. What your heart tells you, that is true. And what you're standing for, you're not alone. Everyone is with you. You've got everyone. You've got a lot of people outside Afghanistan supporting you. They're there for you. So just stand up for what is right, for what you believe in and we will keep supporting you. Thank you, Muska. Um, any of the girls from Calgary Girls School, would you like to address the question of um, advice you would give to, to other young people who are looking to raise their voices on um, advocacy and championing girls' rights? Amelie, go ahead. Well, like that you're never alone and to just never stop. Always keep going, don't give up. Yeah, advocacy work is tireless work for sure. And it, um, it takes patience and determination. You're right. So thank you for that reminder, Emily. Uh, I see a question from Mr. Uh, Dater, your, your teacher. He's saying he'd like to add how important it is to educate youth around the world about the situation in Afghanistan. We need to tell these stories. Thank you so much for saying that. That kind of brings me nicely um, to the overarching um, question that, I, you know, it's come up a lot in the chat and in the Q&A as well. And I think you know what we've we've tried to make sure that all the panelists can equip you to do, which is that what can we do now um, to work in support of the women and girls in Afghanistan? Um, we've seen many different examples of that here today, from the fantastic mentoring initiatives, the online learning, um, the the fact that these the, our young activists um, from Canada are showing up. Um, to kind of raise the voices of young women and girls in Afghanistan when they cannot safely do so themselves, really amplifying their stories and their experiences. We need to tell the world. We need to be loud. Um, we need to keep going with this advocacy. We at Canadian Women for Women um, launched an advocacy campaign actually around this school ban issue last October to mark the International Day of the Girl. Um, we had thought and hoped that the, the contents of that campaign might be at this point redundant a full six months later. Um, sadly, that campaign remains more pressing than ever. The urgency is all the greater with today's announcements and seeing those girls um, in tears, at, you know, kind of asking the world, why, why do we not deserve the full humanity and basic right, the human right to education, simply because we were born girls in Afghanistan. We need to raise our voices. There are a number of things that concerned citizens can do. Um, I, we will share some um, links with you in the chat here before we close and also in that follow-up email. We have a number of resources that are available. People can 
ask their institutions, educational institutions, workplaces to put out statements of solidarity and support um, with uh, girls and, and women in Afghanistan, write letters to your editors, um, post our um, contents to social media, we have some assets there. Um, just speak with your families and your friends and your coworkers and your classmates. Um, tell the world about what's happening in Afghanistan. We all we all need to be aware of that. Um, so I think that uh, I, I will, as I said, I'll share those links in the chat. Uh, and then I really just want to take another moment to thank our incredible um, panelists, all of all of you today doing, you know, showing up to do the work. Um, to Claudia for, for doing such a phenomenal job of, of navigating us through um, this conversation. Um, and, and yes, to say, you know, let's, let's continue to raise our voices um, in support of Afghan women and girls and their human rights to education. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all of you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. In solidarity. <laughs> yes. Solidarity. Yes, that's right. Yes. Thank you.